Welcome to Detail, an original podcast by RCAT. This is a show where we uncover lessons learned to help you navigate your next project. I'm Cherise Lakeside, Senior Spec Writer at RDH Building Science and your host. My guests today are Ted Hyman, partner, and Vlad Pikesh, hopefully I did that right, partner from ZGF Architects, a firm with multiple offices across North America and 750 plus staff. Ted is a cyclist in every sense of the word. From measuring a project's performance over its life cycle to commuting daily from Long Beach to Los Angeles via bicycle, well, <laughs> that's quite a ride. Ted continually strives to reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere. As ZGF's former managing partner, he leads with this essential question. How can we accelerate the evolution of the sustainably built environment? A fierce advocate for halting climate change in its tracks, Ted works across all project typologies to ensure that architects heal rather than damage the earth. Vlad knows the principles of great design are translatable. Having lived and worked around the globe, Vlad designed projects in Europe and Asia before moving to the Pacific Northwest. Here, he finds inspiration in Portland's livability and strong connection to nature, and enjoys the new opportunity to walk past local projects on his lunch break. Vlad is passionate about advancing design dialogue within ZGF and the community and values the role of critique in the design process. He brings a rigorous approach to his multi-office teams, regularly working across the firm's multiple offices and lecturing at universities. The project we will be chatting about today is the William and Linda Frost Center for Research and Innovation at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Crafted as Cal Poly San Luis Obispo's inaugural interdisciplinary structure, the Frost Center seamlessly amalgamates three colleges within a single architectural embrace. It stands as a pioneering example of the evolution in classroom and laboratory design, embodying an open, welcoming, and adaptable space tailored to accommodate the educational needs of an expanding and diverse undergraduate student community. Now, let's get into the details. Welcome to Detailed. My guests today are Ted Hyman, partner, and Vlad Pikish. I apologize in advance. Also a partner at ZGF Architects, a firm, which I'm sure you all already know who ZGF is, but a firm with multiple offices across North America and 750 plus people. At least that's what I found in my trolling on the internet. The project we are going to talk about today is the William and Linda Frost Center for Research and Innovation at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Ted and Vlad, welcome to Detailed. How are you today? Great. 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 Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join me. I've been pretty excited to talk about this project. Um, I always start with a some kind of icebreaker question. It's different for every guest. So for you guys today, what single project that you've worked on so far in your career has been your favorite or that you are most proud of and why? Ted, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, my favorite project is always the one I'm either working on now or the one we're about to get. <laughs> and I would say that right now, Vlad and I are working on a project that was an international competition in Barcelona for a new lab building. And Two, two buildings, actually, and they're going to be, I mean, in addition to being super high performance, highly collaborative and inviting to the community, they're both mass timber buildings, and that's going to be really exciting to see the first lab buildings. Where, you know, we have two of them, lab buildings coming out that are mass timber. And I'm sure it's really painful having to go over to Barcelona. Yeah, not so tough. No, it's... I'm, no, I'm I'm seething with jealousy right now. <laughs> How about you, Vlad? Well, I'll say that with projects, it's a bit like with kids. You know, you can't have favorites, and you kind of have to love them all, but you have to love them differently. So I don't I don't know if that answer. 
serious politicians here. Now, <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking about this, but you know, yeah, it's a little bit like that. Uh, at least for Wait, me. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because my two boys constantly tell me, each one of them will separately tell me that they know the other one is my favorite. It's exactly. just like, and, and they're two complete. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Compete. Compete for my love. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, okay. Let's get started on this project. Um, why don't we start with a general overview of the background of this project? What was the client's mission here? So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, you know, this is, it's a really interesting project because, you know, if you ask Phil Bailey, who was the dean and and raised a lot of the money, you know, he thought about this project over 30 years ago when he was, you know, just teaching, you know, who's on the faculty at Cal Poly. And it started really, the foundation was the building next door that we had done, which is the Baker Center. We finished about 10 years ago now, I think. And it was really built to replace the spider building, which was at the center of the campus, had been there for, you know, I think 70 years. It was a, you know, it was the building for all the sciences. And the idea was to tear it down, build a new, tear half of it down, build a new education building, tear the rest of it down, create a new heart to the campus. Instead, what happened after we built the new building, instead of tearing it down, all the faculty moved in there and used it for research space because the campus had no you know, per, you know, purpose built research space on the campus. So coming out of that, hopefully we're going to get that building torn down eventually. This idea to build a new building that was really focused on research came out across the way. And it was really three colleges that, you know, the College of Science and Math, the College of Agriculture and Liberal Arts. And probably the best thing that could happen is none of those three colleges had enough money to build a big building, you know, on their own. And so they had to pull their resources together to build this building. And that that's kind of how it started. That's an interesting mix. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting mix, but it's really, I think that's where, in some ways, that's where science is going in general. I mean, this idea that STEM education really needs to include the arts to be successful. And here, because the liberal arts program, you know, happened to have a small program that could go into this building. It's doing exactly the kinds of things that should be happening more across the country. And so, you know, it was really putting a lots of different students together, different faculty together that sometimes, you know, probably wouldn't have talked to each other. And we talk about buildings like the science buildings, research buildings as places where the architecture if it's really working great, is causing intellectual collisions to happen. People that wouldn't normally talk to each other are all of a sudden running into each other. We had a client who suggested we put really bad elevators in the building because that was the only way they were going to get people to stand still and talk to each other for you know four or five minutes when the elevator broke down. But it's how do you create those kinds of spaces? And it was, you know, we had these three deans. Sometimes, you know, the schools, you know, the the schools or the colleges compete for funding, they compete for students, and they absolutely compete for space. So putting them all together in one building was a, was a bit of an experiment in its, of itself. And one of the very first things we did was we took the three school or the three colleges and the programs each one of them had, and we kind of did a spaghetti map showing where there were collaborations, talking to faculty and students that were collaborating both within the colleges, but then across the colleges. And it was kind of surprising for certain, certainly for us, but probably even more so for the deans and how much collaboration was already going on between, you know, the, the faculty of those places. And so doing a building that really inf reinforced that and fostered more collaboration was really important. And then the last thing was really something we talk about a lot. This, you know, and Vlad will talk about the site hopefully in a minute. But this idea of putting science on display, that not only the students working in the laboratories and the faculty get to see what they're doing, but we wanted any student who comes into the building, and in fact, any student who walks by outside the building to see science going on. And Dean Bailey's you know, initial idea was we could measure success if an architect or somebody in the sports comes into that atrium and decides to change majors and become a, you know, a, a, an engineer or a scientist, that's what success was going to be. 
I love that. You know, I, I've done a number of university interviews recently, and I'm seeing more and more of that mixing, mixing groups instead of, you know, it's always been traditionally these separate buildings for separate degrees and, and very much this separation of certain separation of church and state, so to say, so to speak. And, and they're like mashing them together. And it, it seems like it's really successful. Um, so I, I, that's awesome. So the nexus of this building seems to be a folk, be a focus on collaboration and cross pollination of expertise. You had a goal of bringing numerous different types of students together. And you may have just answered that, um, but tell me about that. Why, why was that important? Did we just get that answer? I, I think you got most of the answer, but I, and, and to your point, you know, in, in research and science, the, the big breakthroughs are coming from people that are collaborating that wouldn't five, 10 years ago, wouldn't have even talked to each other. And so doing a building, you know, Cal Poly's vision of learn by doing, how do you really create that atmosphere? And, you know, undergraduate, you know, there's some graduate students in there, but at an undergraduate level where they're starting to understand how important collaboration is and how exciting this world can be if you're, if you step out of your own bubble a little bit. So I, I think we answered it, you know, between these three schools and how they're collaborating. But I think it's, it's just walking into that atrium and seeing it happen real time is really amazing. I think we could do a little better but, job of that in, in architecture sometimes, <laughs> getting out of our, as a spec writer, and, you know, I've worked in construction and MEP engineering as well, and now I'm in building science. And so I've, well, I've seen that division between disciplines sometimes in an environment that shouldn't be anything but collaboration. No, the prof I mean, our profession is absolutely that, and it needs to be. And we, I've gone into classes at different institutions where they're teaching interdisciplinary architecture, engineering, and this, you hear, well, the architects drive the bus and the engineers come in and try to make it work kind of thing. And that isn't how it works in, in practice anymore. I mean, it's, so collaborative and we're collaborating with people that, you know, that we wouldn't have imagined collaborating with, you know, early in my career artists, you know, you know, anthropologists, really interesting. And that's what makes this building so much fun to work on. Let's talk about design, um, starting from the outside and working our way inside. So I don't miss anything really cool. Um, Beginning with the site, let's start with the site. Were there any special, I love the challenges, I love the hard stuff. Were there any special considerations related to the site that affected the design of, of this building, which I'm really excited to talk about as well. Um, what was going on with the site? It sounds, cause it sounds like you're going right in the middle of campus and building this building. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the way we went about the the building was sort of sketching out what Ted was just what's on the inside of the building, you know, what's the content, and then placing that on this given location because the location is at the very center of the campus, so it's you know it's kind of centrally located. It's right across the street from another size building that ZG had completed a few years ago. So we're given the site and what goes in there, and the two didn't really fit. It's a difficult site. There are existing buildings, you know, there's slow, there's this beautiful old tree, but you know, once you start putting these things, it's, it's kind of difficult to fit it in. And that's a little bit where we start testing this idea of, you know, if you go around campuses and you go to the engineering part of the campus, usually these buildings are big boxes, you know, walls, very, not very friendly, not very exciting buildings. And they're just kind of sit there, you know, and clearly something like that simply wouldn't fit on our site. So we had to come up with a different idea, which was to start breaking it up a little bit, figuring out what's really on the inside. And then how do we create these like little volumes? They're very functional. They're very rational, but they allow us to sort of fit in this building in a more kind of organic, uh, we, we use the metaphor of, of, of an Italian hill town, you know, kind of like a little little thing that's made out of parts and it's broken up and you walk around it 
So that's kind of how the main idea came about. So that it sort of fits in what's already there. It's not like this massive thing, but somehow it's more organic, more, more part of the place. That's starting to make more sense to me, the shape of the building, um, which we'll get to in a minute. Were there any site features that you designed for this building or was that kind of already preset on the campus? What, what do you mean by site features? You know, courtyards or, or oh. any exterior amenity kind of areas on the site. Sure. I mean, that's, I mean, that was, you know, there's this main walkway where the students are coming by. So what Ted was saying earlier, the idea of the building having this transparency. So as the students are walking by, they can see inside, see the scientists. It's a site feature. You know, it's a building that's, you know, featuring science on display. There's a connection through the building with this kind of bridge element up on top. So that's where the form really comes into place because once you break the box, you can kind of be a little more intentional about, you know, responding with one courtyard, there's a little terrace. And that was very important because, you know, St. Louis Obispo is such a beautiful place. You know, it's like sunny, it's warm. And you want to take advantage of those exterior spaces and you want to kind of bring people closer to the building because it's a nice place to be. And then once they're there, you know, they get to see what's going on. And again, going back to what Ted was saying is this sort of more interdisciplinary and also looking at science as something that it's approachable, you know, that it's inclusive, that it's not like, again, big box, lots of glass and, and stuff, but it's just something that, that engages people on an everyday level. So let's start talking about this building. Um, and you've already said it a couple of times, but my initial reaction, because I always look at the pictures first before I start reading the descriptions and I, and oftentimes I'll go do research outside of the things that you sent me, go read an article about it or, you know, find other things. My first absolute gut reaction, the second I looked at the first picture of the building as a whole was, that's no square box. <laughs> I mean, literally like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? You know, not a building I would expect to, I did school public education work for the first 22 years of my career. So um, it's not out of the norm for me, and that is not what I expected to see when I opened up the pictures. Talk to me about that unique shape of this building. Um, now, you've already described what made you take that path. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the shape of the building and, and why certain parts of the shapes they are to fit what inside yeah. effectively. So... It, it, it would, it's good when people could take a look at the floor plans and we have them on our website because it's, you know, being architects, we look at things in plan and uh, what's interesting, you know, Ted's worked on a number of these buildings over, I don't want to mention the number of years, but <laughs> the realization was that if you really look at these size buildings, they tend to be very big, but actually in terms of how you organize a building, you know, uh, I don't know, residential building is made out of apartments. You can think of a size building we call in little neighborhoods and they're of a certain size, whatever, 90 by 90 feet, but they're smaller than most of these buildings come out. So we use that as an opportunity to literally take this and break it up in these little towers in a very rational, functional way, because this is a, you know, it's a Cal State, it's a Cal Poly building, it needs to meet the budget, it needs to work, all these different things. But it was an interesting way to do it differently than what people usually expect it to do. And then what we liked is this idea of sort of inside, outside, something that makes sense for the users on the inside because it's very functional and it's interesting. And yet it's creating these interesting things on the exterior. The one thing, and you can kind of see it behind, behind Ted's head, is that atrium, you know, and the atrium was also kind of a functional thing because we had these volumes, you know, we we're filling up the site and then there was this leftover space in the middle then then made set to kind of leave it open. And, uh, you know, it's great for ventilation, quality of air, daylight, etc. but it's the heart of the building. And what's really nice about it, when you walk in it, it has an urban scale. And that's really important because the building has a nice urban scale as you walk around it. But then you walk in 
and it sort of feels like why, which again makes sense for the campus, how people move around it. And in this type of climate, it's great because you, you know, like people are constantly milling around. And what, what Ted was saying earlier is that people who are not in the building, just students, they go there to read, to take a nap or whatever, because it's a nice, nice place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would add, you know, the, the thing, and we learned it when we did Baker, because the state gives you a net to gross efficiency, which allows you X number of square feet for quarters to make the thing work. And both of those big, long buildings, you get these quarters up the middle. And when we did ba the Baker building, they really wanted to have faculty and students have a place and there was no space in the program to do that. And we, we, we got creative and we said, we're not going to put quarters in if we don't have to, and we're going to, we're going to combine all that space and make student space out of it instead of quarters. And I think that atrium that we've been able to achieve on this building, there's virtually no quarter space in the building. So while the net to gross has to meet the state requirements, they're getting that, but they're also getting this great space within the building to hang out in front of faculty offices, to hang out in between classes in that middle space. And it really, you know, it's really amazing that you get a building with the same net to gross and yet it has all this space in it for students. And the goal was, you know, to supplant, when we did Baker, the goal was to supplant the student union as the place for kids to hang out, which it did. You know, which was a problem for them because they thought it was going to be a five day a week, you know, nine to five kind of space. And kids were sneaking in there and spending, you know, weekends and all that other time. This space is even better than that space. So I expect, you know, that this will supplant, you know, Baker and the union and the library as the coolest space to be because you get to see science going on. You get to see, you know, other things happening in the space, which you don't get to see in a lot of these other buildings. I, I know my... My youngest son, my last one in college at Oregon State, there was a particular building. It was a newer building, um, and, and I don't remember the name of it, but he loved – he was in a fraternity and lived in the fraternity house. And high achiever, couldn't concentrate in the fraternity. You know, you're not getting anything done with all those Moses running around. So he'd go to this building, and he would hang out there all the time. He and his girlfriend would even go and have a little like dinner together there and study rather than be wherever they lived um, because it was such a nice space. So I, I think it's I think it's lovely how you made so much extra usable space instead of just space to walk. Well, the... Vlad, talk about what I thought you was going to be your favorite building was that second lab building that we're doing, which is Mass Timber at Oregon State right now where that same kind of atrium, the middle space, the heart of the building, you can sit in there, look into the supercomputer facility, which is probably one of the biggest in the country. You can look across and see makerspace where things are happening. I mean, you go up, it's going to, he's going to be more excited about that building when it's done and it's mass timber. Well, he's done with school, but mom still ends up there on occasion for Beavers football games. So, I just went to one recently, so I will definitely have to go check that out when I'm there. When's that one supposed to be done? Yeah, um, two, two years. Just over two, two years, years from now, so it's 25, 20, probably 26, probably, I'd say summer. No, well, no, 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 45 summer, 25, so 24. 25. Interesting. Well, I'll definitely check that out. Um, let's start talking about some design features. Um, we'll start with the exterior of the building. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the design of your enclosure, some of the materials you used. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you want to start, Ted, or should I start? No, no, you start. I go. So the, <laughs> we started off, and this came from the university, to use a brick. And, you know, again, there are pictures behind Ted. They had this, it's a nice brick. It's Pereira, you know, the famous modernist architect from LA. He did a couple of buildings on campus and it's this kind of reddish brick that, so we're like, okay, what are we going to do with that? Um, you know, it's brick. It's... So, so it was interesting because then gradually we start realizing the opportunities inside of this form because the first thing about breaking the volume, you know, it was just like little boxes and, you know, you work in the model. And then the realization was that the way these lab spaces work is that there, there, there's always one facade that needs more light to come in. 
And then it's almost like a book and there are two sides that are great. And so that became a, like a kind of a, a simple idea that then allow us to take the form and really translate it into, again, reinforcing this idea of almost like individual little buildings, you know, like the hill town analogy. So that each lab neighborhood had these like two great side walls. And then you had this kind of these metal panels that they were really optimizing both daylighting and views, you know? So that was nice because the scale was good. Also mixing materials, you know, the brick and then the metal. My favorite thing about the metal is there's a, there's a eucalyptus tree that is the largest eucalyptus tree outside of Australia. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, look. Eucalyptus is very uh, controversial, you know, but I like this tree. It's a beautiful tree. It's like this kind of light silver color, which is almost exactly the same as the metal. And it's really nice when you see this light and the metal and the shade. And then when you're on the inside of the building, that's where this really, you know, like you, you get the light coming through here. There was another thing about these lab buildings that's always, you know, no daylight, no connection to nature. So we were very cognizant that whatever we're doing on the exterior, it's really <clears throat> making this a better place, better building. And that's really nice. You're sitting there, you're having a cup of coffee. You, you know, the day, light is very beautiful coming in. Uh, we have offices with operable windows, you know, which is, again, not very common, especially not for science buildings. So again, it's this idea of inside and outside that it's not beautiful facade, but like don't look on the inside, but it's every, at every point you're aware of this working from both sides. I, I would add Vlad. I mean, the thing that we did normally when you do a science building like this, the perimeter wall, everybody wants to put casework up against it. So you end up with either small windows or bigger windows with all kinds of junk up against the facade. And we sit, we pose the idea of turning the casework 90 degrees to the window. So you, from outside, you can see all the way through and vice versa. And there was a lot of resistance until we actually sat down and measured the linear footage of bench you know, very analytically that you could get. And they lost like less than two feet of bench space. And so, you know, being able to, to prove it out, really, it's amazing the difference in these labs and the ones where... Yeah, you know, the wall is the exterior wall is completely you know covered in casework. I'm going to go down my first rabbit hole. I warned you around about those, right? So obviously, I I now work for an enclosure consultant, and I find that transitions on the exterior of a building from one material to another is is usually some of the most difficult detailing that you have to do to make those things come together and come together tightly. Did you have um, any challenges with the, the glass and the metal and the brick, bringing it all together um, and, you know, and making that work so you still had a nice tight building? I don't know, Ted, you want to take this one? Well, most, I mean, the interesting thing is most of the places where they're brick, the brick is cladding a concrete shear wall behind it. You know, so all the lateral for the building is is done in concrete. And and it just happens, you know, as Vlad was saying, these neighborhoods, you kind of want to put it on on those sides. So the locations of the brick are, I think, almost entirely where we have a concrete shear wall inside the building. So you're really going from concrete shear wall to building envelope, and it's pretty rigorous. So I think the detailing is is pretty straightforward. And no challenges with the unique shape of the building not being that perfect square. They are there. It's really just a series of square boxes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and they come together where the brick is, which is easier to deal with because it's typically a concrete wall back there. I mean, that's you know, without going into too much detail, but from a cost perspective, this is. I mean, I don't want to say it this way, but you know, it's not an extraordinarily expensive build. It looks much more unique and bespoke. It, it's it, it, you know when you break it down, it's it's relatively simple, and we found different ways how to be creative inside of that sandbox of you know things that we could buy in a local market, etc. It's it's essentially those fins are just expanded metal. It's a heavy gauge expanded metal, and then the other thing that was very interesting is there was a lot of fear 
with the the shading, both the horizontal and the vertical of birds. They have mud swallows, which build these mud kind of nests all over the campus, p- pigeons. And we spent all, we had one guy who worked with a professor at Cal Poly and really spent a lot of time understanding, you know, the angle of repose to keep the birds from standing on it, the distance away from the glass. So a lot of the detailing that got put into the building was a response to, you know, keeping the birds from nesting there. That's awesome. You know, Vlad, you made that that comment, like, I, I don't want to say this, that the building isn't as expensive. Oh. I think, personally, in my humble opinion, which is all it is, that's the ultimate success. If you can have a building that looks so beautiful and so classy and so expensive yeah. and, and do that and stay within the budget for the client, that's that's the ultimate goal and the ultimate success. If it looks the way you want it to look when you're done, I'm sorry. I'm a big fan of paying less and getting still what I want. Um, so I, I think that's it. kudos. It's, yeah. It's the, the difference between cheap and uh, cost effective, or, uh, you know, it's nomenclature. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the other thing is, you know, there was a, we did, you know, we had our, you know, the, the required value engineering sessions and, the interesting thing is if you take things like you, t- okay, those fins, they look really nice architecturally, blah, 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 blah. If you take the fins off the building, the mechanical system gets so much more expensive that it's going to, you're going to spend more money than you are the way it is. And so, and Vlad, you had to talk about how those fins were, you know, the modeling that was done on those fins. It, they're not, arch- they're not just, they're not jewelry on the building. They actually really are working. Yeah. Well, well, there's a great lesson just there. Yeah, you know, yeah, spend a little bit more here to save a lot more over here. That's yeah, exactly. It's, it's like the way to design this is that, and it, you know, value engineering happens a lot. And so, if it's purely aesthetic, someone can just take it and take it off. In this case, for example, you cannot take those screens off because your cooling and heating doesn't work anymore. So that means that the aesthetic. I mean, seemingly aesthetic solution is integral to the performance of the, so like you walk around the building and there's a big, uh, concrete column and you say, oh, let's value engineer this concrete column. Well, you can't do it because if you take the column out, the whole building is going to collapse. It's a little bit like here, like, no, 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 you can't do it because, and that's good because it's, it's something that's real. You know, we're not wasting money and it's much more, uh, integrated, especially for a science building, you know, science building should be about science. <laughs> Which looks good, but not not fake. You know? sure. If you actually look closely at the facades, we modeled not only for where, as the sun moves around the building, where you want the shading, but the Baker Center across the you know the walkway is a six story building, and we modeled the shading from the adjacent building and from itself, the self shading elements of the building where the building turns around, and you get less fins where you don't need them. So, yeah, we, we essentially self-value engineered as a way to actually, you know, plan the thing. So it's actually really interesting. If now that you know that next time you look at the building, you'll start to see, oh, there must be, you know, the other building shading it over there. They didn't need shading. Well, that's genius to think of that too. I don't, I mean, I, I don't draw, so I would never think of that anyway, but that's not something that would come to, to mind right away. And it is, I think a good lesson for our listeners is you have to look beyond and think beyond your building when you're trying to make things happen, because there could be things around it that you can use in some way to get to where you need to go. And Uh, tell me about, excuse me, my frog's coming back. Tell me about the two level bridge. I want to understand that more. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the, how the building works because, uh, it's, it's one building. And, uh, so it happened that when we really tried to fit in on this site, the, the main, one of the main walkways of the campus had to go through the building. So in a way we just eliminated, you know, left out that piece that was sitting on the ground, effectively creating the two left bridge. Is it a bridge? 
is it a gateway? You know, it's it's more ambiguous, which kind of makes it nice. There is an image where you see that, you know, we, like Ted was saying earlier, instead of making it just circulation, you make it wider, just a little bit wider. So you can put some chairs and tables. So suddenly something that's just a corridor becomes a place for people to be. And it's really nice because it's kind of comfortable. It's not too big. It's not too small. The views are amazing. And then most importantly, what's really important in these type of buildings is that when I'm on the ground walking by, I see activity in the building, you know, so that it go, going back to this, like what not to do, size building, big, uninviting, cold, whatever, opposite of that bridge, glass, transparency, and you see students relaxing. And these are not even students that, that are in, you know, work there. They're just there because it's a nice space to be and it makes the building inviting, more open, makes students want to come in and, and join them. So that's where the bridge is kind of really important because it's it's stitching everything in a way together. The the other thing, and yeah, you know, when you talked about the site, Vlad, you know, we left that out a little bit. This funny shape of the building, you know, that spans over that walkway and has these these pieces to it. Part of that was you know, as we were designing and schematic design, the president, Jeff Armstrong, came to us and said, I haven't raised all the money for the building yet. The deans haven't raised enough money to build the whole building. We can we can only build this $80 million piece, which was on the one the west side of, of that bridge. He said, how long, because we designed the whole thing, how long can I have to continue to raise money before before we're done and I have to just say this is all the building we can build and we built we designed it so there's the piece with the atrium there's the bridge and the first tower which is chemistry labs and then there's two more neighborhoods that head to the north and said we can design the whole thing and you can wait until you're ready to start construction which gave them effectively about another nine months to raise money and so it was a 80 million 100 million or 120 million dollar project and just let us know before we start digging a hole, which one we're going to do. And he was kind of amazed and we were amazed. He raised the whole amount of money by the end of, before we started construction. So we got to build the whole building. Had we not gotten the money, that bridge would have been the logical place to just stop and say the other half of the, yeah, that bridge is going to connect in the future as a second phase building. But just that kind of innovative way about thinking about how you design a building to allow the client to have the flexibility to continue to raise money was was you know really valuable. We got a whole building, and that's where the form helped because yeah. going back to that Italian hill town, the organic form, you know, there are like I don't know seven of these boxes, five look good, seven look good. It, it gives you that flexibility. It's not a complete form. That's genius. I am so glad you remembered to tell me that. Um, that's that's really, you know, again, I did schools for a long time. Yeah. And I, I so I'm very intimately familiar with the challenges with budgets and fundraising. Or, you know, in, in Oregon, it's tax dollars. You have to pass bond issues or you don't build the school here. And making that flexible design that way so that they're still going to get some some portion of what they want and still be able to do the rest of it later or, you know, add on to it by, by not doing a traditional box um, is really an innovative way to solve that problem. Even if you didn't have the site constraints that you had, it might be something for others to think about. The, the other thing that looks, you know, like, you know, expensive, I, I'll just use that word, you know, was, you know, can we really afford to build this big atrium in the middle of the building? And when you actually sit down and look at it, you know, analytically and what we did, the reality is, you know, if I want to optimize the skin ratio to floor ratio of a building, the best thing I could do is do a circle because that optimizes, you know, that space. Well, obviously you can't do a lab building that's round, but having those very orthogonal labs, the faculty offices are orthogonal, and I'm as close to a circle as I can get. I've really optimized the amount of floor area for exterior envelope on the building. It's actually very, very efficient. Wow, it looks crazy, you know, with the jiggly jaggly. When you actually measure it, we had to prove it to the client. You know, it's actually more efficient. And so, you know, 
to, to that same point, it looks expensive, but it's cheap. It's also, it looks inefficient. And in fact, it's incredibly efficient in terms of net to gross ratio. Any sustainability goals on this project? I mean, not everybody necessarily goes after points or pedals or, or you know, whatever organization we, it is, but. We start the other way around. I mean, when we start thinking about sustainability, the last thing we want to talk about is what's our lead certification? Or are we going to get, you know, what are other certifications are we going after? We kind of flip it the other way and say, what's the right thing to do? in terms of doing the most economical building, both to build, but to operate and maintain. And then when we get all done, let's see where we are. And I think that's, you know, that's something we've kind of done on almost every project we're on. You know, it's like, if I can build a business case for doing sustainability, you're, it's just, you know, like the other conversations, you're not going to argue with me because it's the, it's the best way to do it. And so, by virtue of the space we had that really set us up for some really, really interesting things. And the first one, you know, San Luis Obispo is a fairly, you know, benign climate. It's getting a little hotter and hotter in the summers. All the original buildings on the campus were, you know, the faculty office building is the one that the faculty would point at every time we talked about operable windows. And because it, it has no shading on it, it faces due west and in the afternoon, it's really hot and faculty can't really, you know, stay in their space. So we said, we're going to try to figure this out differently. The idea is all the faculty offices face North. And so they're, they're getting incredible views too. Um, but we are going to give you, we gave them all operable windows. In addition, we put a fan in every faculty office has a ceiling fan in it and there's a radiant panel in it for, for dealing with the, you know, with just water, no air, there's no air conditioning. And I think they've, you know, we found if you give somebody an operable window, their thermal comfort range goes up and down automatically just because they control their own space. And so the offices, you know, they're, they're not getting direct sun. They can open their window. The fan can go on above their head so they get some breeze and that radiant panel can be used. That air gets cascaded into the atrium. There's a wood louver above those faculty offices. That air gets pulled into the atrium space and is really used for ventilating most of the atrium. And the reason that that's happening is because the lab side, which is 100% outside air, you have to have, you know, only, you can't recirculate air in a laboratory environment. And so we did it. We again worked backwards. We counted up the number of fume hoods we were able to accommodate in those lab spaces with a very, very high performance system, which relies on hydronics, water for heating and cooling, and provides only the six air changes that we need for health and safety in those labs. And what that, what that does is it, it, it kind of quantifies how much air you have to bring into that space. Cause I'm sending, you know, that quad six air changes out of that space. And rather than supplying all that to the labs, we're only providing a little or part of it to the labs. The rest of it, we're sucking through louvers from the office, from outside through the office, through the atrium into the labs. And effectively, I'm getting air conditioning for the, you know, the, all those other spaces for free because I need that air re regardless for the lab. So really energy efficient. But the other thing is it makes that atrium is 100% outside air. There's no recirculating air in that atrium. There's no recirculating air in the offices. So while it's really passive, it's a really healthy environment. You know, and you know, after COVID, everybody was caring about that. It also happens to be a way better environment for learning in. I mean, if you're if you don't have CO2 built up in a space, all of a sudden there's all kinds of studies that show your ability to focus goes up. So both from an energy perspective, but also from a health and performance perspective, we feel like, you know, it's, it's a huge win for the university. And then there's heat recovery. So all that exhaust air, those six air changes that have to go out of the building, we're capturing the energy off of all of that before the air gets exhausted up, you know, into the sky and that gets reused again too. So that it, the lab is really a machine, but it's a machine that's operating way below, you know, where you'd expect it to be for a lab. And then water in California is the other big thing. You know, although today, you know, we're not worried about water. It's raining pretty hard outside. 
but the entire site has a whole series of different ways of detaining the water on site and then getting it back down into the, you know, the water table rather than just pouring it out. Nice. Um, we're running a little low on time, so I'm going to skip to tell me a little bit about the interior design of this building, some of the materials and things you did inside to give it the look and feel that it has. Um, maybe I'll just jump in is, um, the, the thing about these buildings that's really interesting, they're working buildings. They have that sort of workshop quality. And so part of it was for cost reasons to make it simple and a little bit raw, raw concrete, raw materials. But part of it is also the character of the building that, you know, this is really, uh, it's a studio. It's a place for science where we want to encourage people to be creative, be relaxed about what they do. And so we wanted to capture that almost like a nice loft kind of a workshop space. And in the end, that was, that was great because all these things that Ted just talked about sort of that came in together because the, to achieve that sort of pure, not purity, but simplicity of the space, it took a lot of effort in terms of coordination, MEP, all these different things, which then led to a kind of a holistic, holistic approach to how we resolve the, the interiors. So I see wood. What, what, what were there any other kind of, what were some of the notable interior finishes that you used inside this building? Well, the, what we tried to do is to reduce the amount of applied finishes, you know, so if, if, if concrete is structure, let's leave that structure exposed. You can see in the images, the ceilings are exposed. And again, sounds obvious, but for a science building, not very common, you know, so more light, more air. Uh, nicer material, you know, and then, okay, we have this concrete and, you know, it's California, it's bring some wood in there. You know, there's this reference not to modernism. So it's a, it's a, it's a building that's not fussy, that there's not a lot of stuff, things cladded and all that kind of stuff. There's something kind of light about it. Um, casual, you know, and again, that, that feeds into these, these notions that Ted was describing more air lightness. Yeah. Construction, I, I always like to say construction is where our design, it, in, in our designs, is where the rubber meets the road. Is it? Um, that's where we find out if, if what we envision can actually be built. And I think some of our biggest lessons learned come during the construction phase of a project that make us all better professionals on the next project. Um, what would you say your biggest lesson learned was from this project during the construction phase that will inform how you approach maybe another project of this type in the future. I'll, 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 I'm going to reframe your question slightly because I think it's true on almost every building we do. It is. Um, but rather than on construction, the whole process, and I'll step back because when we started and when we did Baker, it was even worse. We had a couple that became believers, but the faculty had been in really, you know, hundred year old buildings that were designed for other things and had been, you know, they weren't great. And the faculty felt like they didn't really deserve a nice building. I mean, there's a lot of brutalist buildings on the campus that are brutal. And I went to school there, so I can say it. they were horrible to take classes in. And everybody felt like they didn't really deserve a good building, whether they could afford it or not. And so finding Phil Bailey, who was you know passionate about the students, you know more more than the fa the faculty, he was passionate about the students. Finding somebody like that as an advocate, that when you say you could have it all, he was going to demand he got it all. And having somebody like that, that's an advocate that takes the project and owns the project, things like, you know, there's the, the, uh, the letters on the outside of the building, which is Latin for learn by doing. That was really important to him because he wanted a place for science students when they graduated to be able to get that picture with their parents. That space before the building was done is on the cover of every Cal Poly magazine that comes out, whether it's science or not now. 
and it was it was a small amount of money. It got VE'd out, and Phil refused to give up on it. And so finding that advocate on a project is always so important, I think, to the success. So all the problems, does something not line up when you're pouring it? All those things, they kind of go away if you have an advocate on the client side that's demanding a good building. I mean, Vlad, you can wait. I mean, there, there are all. No, no, I agree. I, I agree with that. You know, the, the in this case, person, uh, Dean Bailey, he, he was there at every turn of this project, and that's critical because all these wonderful things that that we talk about, they will not happen unless there is, you know, ultimately it's the client that that needs to help us realize all of this or leads the realization. Well, likely your decision-making process was a lot more efficient having that person as well. There, there was a moment where we had the faculty and the deans in a meeting because that atrium, we wanted it open and the faculty said, it's got to be enclosed. We need glass walls all the way around it because the noise in there is going to be too loud and you know it's not going to work. And we told Phil it was really important and he walked out of the room <laughs> and went, there's the Frost Fund is a, is a fund that Mr. Frost has given to the school for students to study Steins. And he went out and got some of the Frost students who are some of the smartest kids in the school, bring them into this meeting. We're all sitting around. Their professors are sitting in the room. The deans of those professors are in the room. And he says, we ha we're having a little debate here. Some people want us to enclose that and separate you all where you're going to sit from this atrium and others want it open. What do you think? And the kids to a kid said, look, we want to hang out in this space because the action's here. We want to hear people. We want to be able to talk across the atrium. And if you put the glass in, we probably won't use the space. And Phil just smiled and said, I think we got our answer. You know, and it's having that kind of, I mean, it's just been so much fun to deal with him. Yeah, you know, the, the school is now named after him and his wife. His wife passed away during COVID. The school was renamed after him. So it's the Phil and Tina Bailey you know, school, which they deserve. I mean, they have done so much for that school. But also Mr. Frost, who there was a point where a lot of that wood was going to come out of the atrium and we couldn't afford it. And Phil took Mr. Frost into the atrium and said, look, we're going to have to take this wood out. And Mr. Frost said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, between the two of them, they figured out how to get it paid for. But having an advocate for design on the client side just makes the build, whether the budget stays the same or not, it just makes it so much easier to do a really good build for somebody. I don't know that man, but I can tell already he's like a kindred spirit and I adore him. I mean, I, I just love that. Bring the kids in here. Who are we serving here? These are the people we're serving. I love that. Okay, final question. We'll skip to that. Uh, everybody gets this question on the podcast, so every single guest has had to answer this question, just so you know I'm not picking on you. Just a little question. As individuals, we all hope to live a life that leaves some kind of contribution to make the world a better place. I know I do. We hope we all do. I jokingly call that mission my personal world domination statement, how I'm going to impact my world, maybe not necessarily the whole planet, but my world. I'll take the whole planet. So personal or professional, how do you as an individual hope to make a difference or an impact on our world? What's your personal world domination statement? I'll go first and then Vlad can have the last word. I, I, I am personally not interested in world domination at all but and we've talked about this as a as a as a as all of our partners in the firm we've kind of we've kind of focused it down on three things and every project needs to somehow address these three things because it's our values hopefully the clients that are attracted and want to work with us have similar values the first is that the buildings have to have an impact and in a case like the Frost Building, the impact is how do I get students to get better grades, to do better, go on, become you know, scientists, become engineers, astronauts. We have a few of those. How do I do a building that impacts people's lives in a positive way? The second thing is, you know, and we started in the Northwest in the, you know, in the current partnership in the 60s. It's always been about sustainability and climate change. Every building we do has to address that in a big way. 
And then the third thing, which we've been talking probably seven, eight years now is about justice and equity, not only for our own firm, but for the people that are occupying our buildings. And it's that point we made at the start. How do I get any kid on this campus who's afraid to be, you know, for, you know, they're the first kid in their family to go to college, whatever that issue is, that I, that building feels open and inviting and inclusive to them and that they want to become, you know, they want to be a better person than they would have had they not experienced the building. And that's, for me, it's not world domination. It's just making the world a hell of a lot better place than it is before we got here. Vlad? I mean, I, you know, I agree with what Ted just said, that that is really kind of the core of, of what we like to do. And, you know, combining education, combining science, it's just a very nice, nice, uh, what's the right word? Typology. You know, if you're, if you look at all the different buildings that architects can do, combining those things is just really nice. And, and you, you, you get to work with really cool people, like in this case, Dean Bailey, you know, on the, on many researchers, it, it's just, you know, you look back and you're like, yeah, that was a, you know, you got to pay the bills and do all of that, but that was really nice way to spend time. It's very fruitful. You know, it's, it was fun process of discovery. You look back, that's a very nice project, nice people we work with. And going back to what Ted was saying, we, you know, we think we made an impact. We made, we made these kids experience better and more meaningful, et cetera. So maybe that sounds selfish, but it's, you know, it's not a bad way to uh, get through the day. <laughs> In my opinion, that is achieving that personal world domination. You know, how many lives are you affecting? You'll never know anything about Yeah, that. And that ripples beyond uh, making somebody feel safe or comfortable or included or easier for them to communicate or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, coming from Portland, born and raised in Portland, ZGF has been a backdrop throughout my entire career. As a matter of fact, one of my mentors, Lee Kilborn, was your spec writer in the Portland office for 50 years. As a matter of fact, I just saw him last week. Uh, he's, he's not working anymore, but he's still around. And he was also, when I was a young person in this industry, the most feared <laughs> spec writer of all spec writers out there. And if you were coming up, when I moved to MEP for a while after the, the economy tanked in 08, in my firm said, we're doing this project for ZGF, and Lee Kilborn is going to tear you to pieces. <laughs> we get like 20 pages of comments back. And I sent my spec over for him to review on their project, the MEP spec. And he sent it back and I had a page and a half of con uh, comments. That was the day I felt like I arrived. <laughs> like I felt like I'd finally, I mean, you're learning every day, but I felt like I arrived as a spec writer. And, and I, I jokingly call him dad now. I'm his favorite daughter. Um, but ZGF has been this backdrop and this such a well-respected firm that does beautiful work um, and always has been. You guys have maintained that throughout my entire career. We won't tell you how many years that's been. Um, so I just wanted to thank you and tell you how honored that I am that you are here today to share your work with me. Um, I, I really do. I have the most respect in the world for your firm, and I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you so much for being here. And Cherise, yeah. I, I was around. I was what I I spent a lot of time in Lee's office as a young designer and an architect, yeah, where he was taking me, telling me how important the specs were, and making me do things on the specs. Well, I don't know if you ever were in his office, but if OSHA would have seen his, you know, that was back in the days where all the specs were hand. -picked. And there were stacks of specs, probably six, seven feet tall, lining all the walls in that office. There was no window. <laughs> and all I was thankful for is there are no earthquakes in Portland because you couldn't have gotten out of that room if something happened. <laughs> but yeah, Lee was Lee was a, a person, an educator, or is. I mean, you. I every time I tried to get past that door and I got dragged in, I learned more in those couple hours sitting with him than you learn, you know, in school. Well, he was famous and, and is still, even though he's retired with all the manufacturer's reps, that when they walked into his office at ZGF, 
and they would hand him their business cards, the first thing he would do is look at it and see if it had CDT after their name or if it had CSI or CDT, especially CDT. Right. And he would tell them, go away and come back when you have your CDT because then I know you can talk to me. <laughs> and now, and you know, now I've been teaching CDT for about 10 years. Um, he, he is um, well-loved in in portland and still joins us at csi meetings and hangs out and we give him a hard time but um you know he was he was one of those many pieces of zgf that spoke to the quality of your firm and the attention and care that you put into your projects well thank so, you so gentlemen thank you for joining me today um, amazing project i'm going to go look at all the pictures again now now that we've talked about it um and and i uh hope you'll come back um, and sure. talk to me when you, you have, you know, another, just give me a call. Hey, Sharice, you're going to want to hear about this one and we'll set it up. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.